It is another uh, Oklahoma Sooners vidcast, if you will. Garen Emig, sports columnist for the Tulsa World, joined by Eric Bailey. A reminder that there are two ways to consume, three ways, really, to consume OU content. You got the old-fashioned way by picking up your newspaper or uh, or clicking on TulsaWorld.com every morning and reading what Eric has to write about the Sooners. You can watch us uh, work our magic once a week at TulsaWorld.com as we give you a video presentation, or you can take the audio of, of the video we're calling that a podcast. I don't think anyone else has ever used the term podcast, Eric. So you'll <laughs> let me know if I'm wrong about that. Um, you can please uh, access, download, subscribe, all that, all that stuff through Apple, Google, and Spotify. Not just what Eric and I do every week, but um, what Eli Letterman and I do with OSU Sports, as well as what Bill Haston and I do every week regarding general topics of interest. Since uh, I've got Eric on the phone, so to speak, I thought we'd talk about the Sooners and um, something you wrote in Friday's World, I thought, was which was very interesting, sort of crossing the streams, right, with uh, softball and football and a connection between the new starting qu- potential, new starting quarterback for the Sooners and the soon-to-be all-time home run leader in college softball. Tell us about Jocelyn Allo and Dylan Gabriel. Really cool thing. Uh, we had a chance to talk to Jocelyn yesterday during the uh, OU softball media availability and it's fun catching up with her and just she's a delightful young lady, just fun to cover. We, we had a lot of fun covering over the years, but, uh, you know, she's from Hawaii. And so when Dylan Gabriel announced he was going to come to Oklahoma, it just seemed, seemed common sense to ask her about having another Hawaiian on campus at Oklahoma. And really, when you think about it, Dylan Gabriel could be the face of the OU football program. Jocelyn really is the face of the, the softball program. So you got two Hawaiians in Norman, Oklahoma. I said, what, what, what do you think about this? And she was excited. She was pumped up. She, she, you could tell they've already developed a friendship. Uh, he, he, she said she already invited him over to eat some uh, chicken katsu curry, Hawaiian dish. And so they, she cooked a meal for him, just said she wanted him to feel at home in Norman, Oklahoma. So I, I just think it's so cool that when you see these, these kids from all over different places of the country, thousands of miles from home, they still find that common ground and, and uh, live a little bit of Hawaii here in Norman. So it, it was really cool. And it, it was fun talking to her about that. What, what was the dish again? Chicken katsu curry. I've never had it. <laughs> <laughs> she said it's a Hawaiian dish. It's rice, chicken katsu, and, and curry. And uh, she, she made me laugh because she said that she wanted to make potato salad, but she got too lazy. <laughs> with the chicken katsu curry so but it was pretty cool it's pretty cool just to see those friendships develop among two really high profile names in the athletic department and if i'm not mistaken there was actually a third wheel right to their their, their meeting a d- defensive lineman who's transferred from hawaii the university of hawaii to ou and I be- i'm going to try this it's jonah laulu i believe laulu yeah it was i funny. believe that's perfect. it yeah, she said it perfectly. Uh, Jocelyn said the name perfect. Uh, he's originally from Vegas, but played at the uh, University of Hawaii and transferred. He's going to be on the defensive line for Brent Venables. And uh, she said she invited him to, to dinner, too. And it was just her her uh, her comment was great. Just just a bunch of poly kids just eating food. So that was, <laughs> that was awesome. A lot of people already geared up. For OU softball, the Sooners ranked number one in another poll, I think, this week, uh, just ahead of Oklahoma State. I think it was the uh, uh, Softball America top 25. Uh, softball America, ESPN.com, USA Softball. There, Yeah, there's a lot of polls, and Oklahoma is the consensus number one this season. So uh, we'll, we'll crush the Sooners uh, softball beat a little later in the spring. I promise we'll get back to them eventually. But, uh, Eric, with uh, signing day beckoning for 2022, that's next week, We'll, we'll focus on that a little bit, but also talk ha- a little bit about 2023 because Oklahoma got a pretty important member of that class this week at a very important position. Tell us what you know about Jackson Arnold. Jackson Arnold, you know, you wondered what was going to happen, you know, in developing and, and kind of recruiting ahead. Uh, Oklahoma, of course, has Nick Evers in this signing class. And you wondered, well, how's Oklahoma going to handle next year? And they didn't waste any time in getting the young man out of Denton Geyer. Uh, just outstanding quarterback, you know, he really seems to fit, fit Jeff Levy's system. When Jeff Levy was offensive coordinator at Ole Miss, he offered him. He, he's, he's been on Jeff Levy's radar for some time now. And the, the big question was, is Oklahoma going to go after Arch Manning? Uh, you know, in that 23 class, you just wondered. He was the big name. He was the big fish in the quarterback pool. But Oklahoma, it just seems like this was a better fit for them. Uh, and uh, it was a quick yes for uh, Jackson Arnold. It was just, I think it's good because it really sets up that quarterback's room 
which is, you know, you lose Spencer Rattler, you, you lose Caleb Williams, you wondered what was going to happen. And now you got Dylan Gabriel, you got Nick Evers, and now you got Jackson Arnold. So you have you have some depth at that position and all three quarterbacks are going to learn under Levy's system, which is good for the Sooners. A couple things about Arnold. Uh, his numbers were off the charts as a junior at Denton Geyer. Um, did not play much as a freshman or sophomore because the starter there was a future Texas A&M uh, quarterback. Stowers, I believe, is his last name. And so the only time anyone saw Arnold was in an emergency situation. He had to come into as a freshman the Texas State High School Championship game in 2019 when Stowers got hurt on the first drive. Uh, it didn't go real well, not that it should have gone real well for a 15-year-old freshman who had not taken a varsity snap before. That was against Austin Westlake. Uh, this year, starting for Geyer, Arnold led the team back to the state championship game against Westlake. Again, Westlake won it. They, they seemed to always win it in, in Texas. Uh, I think the score was 40-21. to 21. But uh, that was to no fault of Arnold's. He had a he had a solid game and he had a fantastic season. And Eric, if anyone's asking, well, is he a runner or a passer? The answer to both questions, I think, is yes. He is he is a guy that that not a classic that may be a RPO a run pass option quarterback, but very much a dual threat. You know, it's going to be interesting how Oklahoma fans accept these quarterbacks because under Lincoln Riley, you usually got the five star number one guy in the country. And uh, you really almost get spoiled with that when you see some guys like Kyler Murray and Jalen Hurts, and then you get Spencer Rattler and Caleb Williams. You, you look at who, who uh, Lincoln Riley was able to bring in, you get spoiled by that. You can't get lost on the fact that these guys coming in, while they may not be number one, these are some of the best quarterbacks in the country. You can't go in and thinking, well, Nick Evers isn't in the top two or three quarterbacks in the, in the class. No, but he is outstanding. And same with Jackson Arnold. These guys are, they're high profile quarterbacks. They're what Oklahoma needs and, you know, proximity. I mean, this is, you're, you're going down to Texas and getting quarterbacks. That's just going to open the eyes of more quarterbacks down there in years to come too. I mean, Oklahoma, they're going to get the best of the best and at that position. And I think Jeff Levy understands that what's been built here at OU over the Riley years. And he wants to maintain that. And I think they took a big step toward that with these last two high school quarterbacks that they're bringing in. So the quarterback position starting to, to sort of solidify moving forward. Gabriel, by, for all intents and purposes, is the guy for next season, the transfer from UCF by way sort of of UCLA. Um, then it would Nick Evers is the, the guy who's a, a mid-year enrollee who's going to have to get familiar with college life, not just college football. And then that sets up Arnold's arrival uh, perhaps this time next year. Is there – any chance that Jackson Dart fits into this anywhere, or is, has that uh, has that uh, cliched ship sailed, Eric? It's funny because everyone was keeping an eye on him a couple of weeks ago, and I, I really do think you hit the nail on the head when he said the ship has sailed. It just seems like he's going to he's looking for somewhere where he can play, and uh, it looks like Ole Miss may be the landing spot for him. I, you know, I've heard there was concerns if he did come to Oklahoma. He was wondering was Dylan Gabriel going to be. Uh, name the starter because just his familiarity with Jeff Levy's offense uh, would he be would it be a fair competition because of that and I think that's that's a fair question for anyone coming in I mean when you go compete against someone who's already played in the system before you wonder okay well will I get a fair shake and that's not to say I you know I he would have I'm almost sure he would have under Jeff Levy I think he would have got a fair shake but it's still you want to play you're a competitor you want to I think just I think that ship has sailed. Oklahoma is really set at the quarterback position, and you really want to develop what you have in that quarterback's room with those two high school kids coming in. So I think that what you see is what you get right now going forward with the quarterback position. You gave uh, readers a glimpse, and back to Arnold for just a second, uh, a, a glimpse in, into the young man when when he committed earlier this week with the write-up for the world. I'm, I'm writing a column for the weekend. Spoke to Rodney Webb, the coach at Denton Geyer, who's had Arnold the last couple of years in the program and learned a little bit about his, the season he's had, the kind of kid he is, but also it reinforced something that you mentioned just a little bit ago, his relationship with Jeff Levy. Eric, this feels like an important moment, not just for the, the 2023 OU football roster, but it, but it sort of gives Levy a chance to make his first real noticeable impact, does it not? As, as the new guy who's, who's running the offense, uh, in place of, uh, of of Lincoln Riley, who's obviously at USC. So uh, let, let me know if if, um, if you agree that 
that uh, I mean, we're learning more about, about Levy with 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 each day he's a Norman. But to get a kid of, of Arnold's caliber, four star Metro a Metroplex uh, offensive player of the year. You see, again, this is about sort of turning the page, isn't it? From Riley to Levy, just in terms of OU's offense. And this should, this seems to, to be helping do that. Yeah, it does. I mean, when you look at how quick Jeff Levy has worked, I mean, to sign Nick Evers in December during the signing period, to get Dylan Gabriel, you know, hours after Caleb Williams enters the transfer portal, and now to get the commitment from uh, Jackson Arnold. I mean, he wasted little time on getting that quarterback for all those three classes, you know, the current the current team, next year's team, and two years from now. He, he wasted a little time. He knew what he wanted, and he went out and got it. And I think the important thing with both these quarterbacks, especially Jackson Arnold, you have a quarterback now that you can talk to recruits about. You need some wide receivers. You need linemen. Well, here's the quarterback you're going to play with. And I think that was important, too, because it really sets things up. You build around what you got at the quarterback position, and I think that's going to be big in the 23 class. And we'll probably start seeing some names – uh, filter in after this uh, after this commitment. Hey, something else that happened this week, and I didn't want to let it pass without a, without a comment. Uh, and this is related to the 2022 class. Uh, Gentry Williams, the hot uh, hot shot from Booker T. Washington, the the, the defensive back, uh, reaffirmed his commitment. Did he not to, uh, to to OU this week? He did, and he was one of those. If you remember on the, the week, uh, you know, the days before the first early signing period, when he announced he was going to wait and not sign, it kind of caught everyone off guard. And he wondered what's going to happen, but uh, it, it appears that uh, Brent Venables and his defensive staff have really made an impression on him. And you know, here's an interesting, interesting rule: he got to take another official visit to Oklahoma this month. Uh, usually, you only get one official visit, but since there's a different coaching staff. He was allowed another chance to go and take an official visit to Oklahoma to get to know this coaching staff. I think that really was big. Uh, we're going to try to hook up with Gentry. I've traded text with them. We're going to try to hook up with them before signing day to, to, to talk about his decision to come to Oklahoma. And I think that's just another big name for the Sooners at that, that secondary spot. I mean, and it's not only just a big name, it's an it's a in-state kid. And, you know, we've seen years past when some of the best in-state talent has left the state. I think it's important to, to keep some of these players in state. And I think Gentry Williams, we'll see if this is just a sign of things to come with this staff keeping uh, the borders shut in, ter in terms of uh, getting some of the top quality talent and keeping them home. Obviously, the focus moving forward for Venables and Levy and the rest of the OU staff is on 2023. But uh, there is uh, the, the marker being the late signing day coming up this Wednesday in terms of 2022. We'll keep an eye on that. And I know you'll have uh, a lot more on that as we approach, uh, approach the late, the second signing day uh, next Wednesday. Switching gears to basketball, uh, did want to mention this, uh, did want to highlight uh, Porter Moser Sooners. Obviously, Eric, they got a win that I'm not sure a lot of people saw coming this week. Tell us about what happened in Morgantown. Well, you know, it, they had uh, lost four straight going to Morgantown. And, you know, and no shame in the four games they lost when you lose to Kansas, you lose to Baylor, you win, lose to these national, champ or national caliber teams. There's no shame in these losses. And I think what was tough for the Sooners was all those losses were pretty close. They never really were blown out, except maybe the Baylor game at home got out of hand a little bit. But they were still in that late, you know, in the second half. So I, I think it was a huge win to go to Morgantown and, and get a big win on the road after losing four straight games. And Tanner Groves uh, had a big game, finally kind of broke out of a little slump that he'd been in. And I think that was important. And then his, his brother, Jacob Groves, uh, got inserted into the starting lineup the first time they had started together since the, playing against Kansas uh, in the NCAA tournament last year when they were at Eastern Washington. And Jacob Groves probably had his most complete game at OU. So maybe that's a sign of things to come. Maybe you get uh, those two brothers in the starting lineup and, and see what you can build off of that. And uh, uh, Marvin Johnson had a great game. They, they went to the bench and, and really, really, the bench really came through for them as well. So I, I just think it's, it's still going to be tough. They got number one Auburn on Saturday. I mean, th this, this is a heck of a schedule for Porter Mosier. I mean, his first year and he's playing top 10 teams, it seems like every, every week. So uh, it, Oklahoma has nothing to lose. I mean, I, I think right now their, their net is in the top 50. They're, they're, you know, they're playing their way into the NCAA tournament. They need some more wins against quality companies. For, the, for their sake, they're going to get a lot of opportunities in the second half of this conference season. Now you mentioned the NCAA tournament. I think someone's bracket, there's so many of them all out there. Not Lenardi may be the godfather with his bracketology, but there's four or five you can, you can find within a 10-minute web search. I believe one of the, the mocks 
had OU in the first four yeah. uh, coming out of last weekend. So this, this has become sort of uh, danger, da- the danger zone yeah. in terms yeah. of their NCAA prospects. It, it's really funny because the last couple of years, they've been an eight or a nine seed. And that's a tough seed because you win one game, your reward is playing the top seed. And of course, right. they the Virginia and Gonzaga in recent years uh, in the NCAA tournament. And so, but I, I saw a mock, uh, I think today I saw a mock where they were uh, eight or nine seed playing Loyola of Chicago. How interesting would that be <laughs> for Porter Mosier to play his former team in, in the NCAA tournament? So, yeah, I think Oklahoma's in good shape. But I still think they need some wins. I think they need to they really get some quality wins. You got Baylor in the rearview mirror. You still have to go to Allen Fieldhouse. Texas Tech, I, I tell you, the job that they've done down there, uh, that's going to be a tough game. They still have two against Tech to play. So there's this schedule of like we said, still got to go up to Ames and play Iowa State. This schedule is going to be tough, uh, but there's going to be opportunities for them to help themselves as well. Well, they'll be in the spotlight against Auburn Saturday, as you mentioned. They're not a, they're not favored to win that game. Obviously, the number one team in the country is a, a pretty pretty uh, safe bet to uh, to prevail. But if the Sooners can can even uh, be competitive, hang in, make it interesting down the stretch, who knows how how the game goes? But sets up uh, perhaps in the eyes of uh, of selection committee members and others that they are, in fact, a, a legitimate NCAA tournament team. What um, we talk, We've been raining praise on uh, the, the, the women's basketball program, Eric, and the, and, the, and the times we brought them up. And then what happens this week? Someone for K-State dropped 61 points on them. <laughs> what, they, what happened? I think Oklahoma had 65 and uh, one player for K-State had 61. So uh, I said, <laughs> yeah. That was that was a tough game for the Sooners. I mean, you're you're battling the six five post player and you're undersized going into that game, and I think that was just the perfect storm. And she couldn't miss. I mean, he had an amazing uh, stat line. So it was just one of those games where Oklahoma had to learn from it, flush it, and move on. And they really did. They played really they played Bedlam and won a big Bedlam game, huge Bedlam game. That right. was time when uh, and and it kind of righted the ship a little bit. And the interesting thing about this Oklahoma team is just how they share the basketball and how they're they're not too dependent on their stars, Taylor Robertson and Maddie Williams. They have other players that are really stepping up and just impressed with, and we say it every week, just impressed with the job that Jenny Branchek's done with this Oklahoma team. They're 17 and three right now. They're tied for first in the big 12. Uh, they're just playing really well. And uh, they, they play, uh, you get through one rivalry game this week when you play Oklahoma State. Now they got Texas tomorrow on Saturday at home. So, uh, you know, a number nine Texas team that's playing really well too. So it's going to be a big game for Oklahoma. You win this one, man, you're, you're, you're back on top of the world again. And it just Oklahoma basketball, the women's basketball team has been fun to watch. Yeah. Well, and we mentioned the NCAA tournament and the situation for uh, Porter, Porter Moser's men. Coach Branchick has a team that, again, you look you look across the landscape of what's coming for the NCAA women's tournament. There's an outside shot that that the Sooners could play themselves in a hosting a regional, right? Is oh, it, 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 yeah, and it, it's been a long time since Oklahoma fans have been able to have that discussion about hosting a regional, and Oklahoma's positioned themselves well to do that. And what a reward that would be for these seniors when you think about Maddie Williams and you think about Taylor Robertson. Uh, these players have really grinded through some tough seasons in Oklahoma. Uh, in these last couple of years with nine win seasons, nine win seasons, I think they were 12 and 12 last year. So uh, you think about it, it'd almost be a reward for those players that have been through this and weathered this to play an NCAA tournament on their home floor. So uh, it's something to watch. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done to, uh, to accomplish that, but boy, they put themselves in a really good spot right now. Okay, another reminder, men's bedlam is a week from tomorrow in Stillwater, correct? Early, That's early, correct. early, early game. game. Yeah, 11 o'clock game in Stillwater. So it's uh, uh, at Auburn, number one, at K-State, and then at, and then at OSU? I think it's TCU here. Oh, TCU. I'm thinking of, I'm yeah. thinking of OSU. I'm sorry. <laughs> TCU yeah. and Norman, and uh-huh. then Bedlam and Stillwater. So two emotional games because you think Oklahoma lost at TCU in a game they should have won earlier. That's right. That's right. So I think it's going to be an emotional game, and it's going to be a quick bounce back game too. They're going to have to play pretty fast to get back on the road into that game. And then you got Bedlam at the end of the week. Porter Mosier's first game at Bedlam. A lot of these Oklahoma players that haven't played in Bedlam before, it'll be first for them too. So it's kind of you go from the ranked teams to an emotional week, and that that's what's going to happen next week. All right. So we'll follow basketball, football, a little softball mixed in as well because of the uh, the overpowering might of Patty Gasso's program with the Jocelyn Allo leading the way. 
Uh, keep reading Eric's material. Keep tuned in to our, uh, our weekly uh, video. And again, you can find us on Apple, Google, and Spotify for your OU Sooners Tulsa World podcast. Please download and subscribe, and please enjoy your week. Thanks very much for listening. For more information, you can visit TulsaWorld.com.